You know, we all have a lot of data, and it has to positively, absolutely stay safe. It can't get into the wrong hands, and the biggest challenge we have is how to transfer it from here to there. We all know as leaders that legacy tools that transfer our important files and sensitive data are mostly outdated and fall short on security, especially with the demands of today's remote workforce. Relying on outdated technology puts our organization's brand at risk, and that is unacceptable. So we're excited to invite you to step into the future of completely secured managed file transfer from our friends at KiteWorks. KiteWorks is absolutely positively the most secure managed file platform on the market today. They've been FedRAMP moderate authorized by the Department of Defense since 2017. And unlike traditional legacy systems with limited functionality, KiteWorks has unmatched software security with ongoing bounty programs and regular pen testing to minimize vulnerabilities. And the coolest part, they have easy to use one-click appliance updates you will love. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. And now, the show. Hey everyone, today we are going to cover how extortion is used by cybercrime and share some undercover crime stories exposing cybercriminals with the world's most prominent author and security researcher, formerly in U.S. intelligence, Mr. John DiMaggio, senior researcher with Analyst One. Today we bring you undercover stories of cybercrime and explore when cybercrime gangs are caught. This is the story of John DiMaggio and crime stories exposing cyber criminals. Come join us as we dive deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Interviewing top technology leaders from around the world and sharing true cybercrime stories to raise awareness. From the creators of Vigilance, the newest global technology newsletter, translating cyber news into business language we all understand so please help us keep this going by subscribing for free to our youtube channel and downloading our podcast episodes on apple and spotify so we can continue to bring you more of what matters this is cybercrime junkies and now the show All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to Cybercrime Junkies. I'm your host, David Morrow. In the studio today is security researcher. It's like it's like cybersecurity royalty in the house. <laughs> John DiMaggio, who uh, works with Analyst One and recently published Ransomware Diaries 4. That's also known as... Ransomware, Ransomware Diaries, Diaries 4. Very cool. And, um, John, we're really excited. Welcome to, to the studio. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me again, man. It's always, uh, it's always good to talk to you. So things have been going, uh, things have been going well at work. Things have been going well. We've been so busy. It's been, Cyber it's been crazy. Cybercrime is up. Things are like, yeah. cyber criminals are still out there. Yeah, I'm waiting for when we have a, a, a right? ceasefire so I can take a vacation. Yeah, it's really not a fad, is it? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. It's been it's been crazy, man. I, I barely took off any time during the holidays. Yeah. It was it was nuts. I think I took off Christmas and New Year's Eve, Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. Besides that, I was working seven days a week uh, since before Thanksgiving. So I'm glad to have that thing done and uh, and out, so I can actually take a breath and relax for a minute. Um, you know, but until the next thing, right? <laughs> Yeah. So for listeners who don't know you, John, um, you worked uh, in the government uh, previously uh, in the intelligence community. And um, that's all we're going to say. Otherwise, you'd have to kill me. That's right. And uh, and then, uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't know what he did. I just stood across his house with a telescope and a bullet <laughs> so I could figure out. That was you? Yeah, that was me until you gave me that little like, oh, you know, that cease and desist thing. Don't, right. 
you know, no, I'm just teasing. And then, um, and then you've been, uh, you've been in the private sector for, for a while doing a lot of research and, uh, his work has involved undercover work in the past as well. Um, actually going on the dark web or going through telegram channels, et cetera, and speaking with cyber criminals. And now he's developed professional, um, elements of communication with them, which allows, uh, John exclusive access to, uh, certain aspects of the criminal element, which is fascinating to people like us. Um, because it, you know, how can you defend against a foe you don't know? Which I believe is a phrase we coined on the last episode. I believe it was copyrighted. Like I think I I need to get a T-shirt that says that. You um, do. Your pen. So so John's prior work was disclosing um, and and investigating the Lockbit ransomware gang uh, to the point. And to the amusement of the Lockbit gang, where they on the dark web, you know, they all have their own website, their own channel. And they had John's avatar on there as their as their avatar. So um, I wanted to ask you in our prior episodes, you can check those out on YouTube or on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. Um, just look under Lockbit or John DiMaggio. They're all in there. We could have links to it in the show notes here. But um, I recently saw uh, that Lockbit, and, and, and maybe we, we set the context first, but, but Lockbit was threatening to do harm to one of their former hackers who had a dispute over payment or something. Yeah, well, so with that, they tried to uh, to dox them, and yeah, they didn't they didn't specifically say that they were going to harm them. They insinuated it, but they didn't actually say it. Um, it could have, but, but yeah, it got pretty crazy. It got pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, it could have just been tough talk. But can you explain to the listeners? So, cybercrime is such a big business that when you know you have the cyber criminal groups, the like think of organized crime. You have. Don Carleone, you have like the heads of the families, right? The, the heads of the groups. And then they have all these other actors working for them and they're contractors essentially. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that is a fair assessment. It's so it's exactly that they, uh, that they are not like employees. They, they, they work with them and the share profits. Fund, exactly. Like pension fund off like PTO policy. He's no benefits. Yeah. <laughs> No paid vacation. Yeah. You want to be a digital mercenary? We don't give you paternity leave or a (laughs) four. It's all 1099 work. 1099, man. (laughs) Uh, Okay. And then if there's a dispute about like, hey, I got this money. Oh, you got more. You didn't. Like, let me ask you this. What are some of the disputes over? Like, isn't there just one pot of money? Or like Lockbit does things differently. They let the the attackers kind of fund, like hold on to the, some of that money. So are there, dis- how, how, how do their disputes arise in the first place? Yeah. Well, there's a great example, which just happened last week, but uh, essentially um, Lockbit does let his affiliates uh, control the money. However, um, there's other elements, access brokers and other uh, elements that have resources that they provide where they do rely on getting paid. Um, it was uh, yeah, it was about a week, week and a half ago. Um, an access broker provided ac- access to a network that Lockbit and their affiliates uh, utilized to extort a victim, and they didn't agree up front on payment. And this person got upset. So what they can do, and what they did do, is on these forums, on the Russian hacking forums, they have um, basically you can go file a a complaint, and it goes into this arbitration process where both parties have to submit evidence, whether they're technical logs or chat logs or whatever it might be to support their claim. And then the the administrator is supposed to be an unbiased unbiased party that reviews it all and makes a judgment. Um, once that judgment's made, whoever he awards the, the that to, they have to the other party has to pay them 
whatever they, they the dispute was it about. If they don't pay, they get banned for the for the forums, and that's what just happened to Lockbit. So my picture is no longer there. They got canceled basically off of both the two top hacking forums. Uh, something I didn't know. We just put a blog out today on this. Me and Anastasia uh, wrote it. Uh, from Angles one, we put it out today. But um, basically, what happens? Yeah, as they go through this arbitration process, you pay or you don't pay. If you refuse to pay and you've lost the arbitration, you get banned. If you get banned on one forum, though, other Russian forums, hacking forums, take take note and follow suit with that judgment. So Lockpick got kicked off of multiple forums and was pretty upset about it. Wow. So let's unpack what you just said real quick. And then I want to get into ransomware diaries for sure. um, what you just explained is there's basically a judicial system or an arbitration system, right? Like yeah. a, a independent arbitration where when there's financial disputes, they both agree that this third party will make a decision and they will be bound by that. Otherwise there will be consequences. That is correct. Yes. And in this instance, because Lockbay didn't pay. So even criminals, they, do this. it's very similar to yes. organized crime, even that, right? Because they, they still like even the yeah. organized crime families, when we think of the mafia and the, uh, sit down. Yeah, they <laughs> all have the cartel, they all have the, the actual council where the heads of all the families meet and they decide certain rules. So yeah, it's, it's a similar concept here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's similar to that. And, um, you know, it's, you would think like, to, to me, I'm like, okay, who cares? You get kicked off a forum, go create another account or whatever it might be. But, you know, it takes a long time to build up these reputations and they have different ranks on the forums. And because Lockbit didn't pay, they now have this big banner across his, his profile that just says Ripper, which is basically like saying they're a scammer. They cheat people out of money. It's an, it's a, it's a really low insult in the hacking community. And that's why uh, Lockbit is so upset about it. So Lockbit were their former, page was they have a big banner over it that's and i'll find an image of it hopefully i could throw this up by the time this yeah, I, I can share it with, too, with yeah, you that's no it says ripper r-i-p-p-e-r yeah well it's in russian but yeah well yeah yeah we <laughs> with ai and deep fake we could just redo this whole episode in russian and then look, right you know we're already we're already redoing our episodes in in uh uh, various languages because we're apparently very big in Cambodia right now, as well as the <laughs> Netherlands. So I may, move, you know, just be treated like royalty. I may just, right. just there, be like, oh yeah, that's our podcast. Um, so tell me, um, what was the impetus for Ransomware Diaries for? Like, this is about a a ransomware as a service gang, or at least one that purported to be one. And yeah. you uncovered a whole bunch of stuff. Like you were unraveling this gang. And there was, it was, I kept reading it. I'm like, oh, these guys are just getting hit left and right. So yeah. talk about the story. Who is it about? Where do these cyber criminals live? What's their name? Walk us through it. Yeah. So um, when I finished the Ransomware Diaries 3, I was looking on the forums, um, just seeing what, what, Lockbit and other parties were saying about it. And uh, one of the posts was from an account that I hadn't seen before. It had just been created in their signature. It said owner and creator of Ransom, Ransomed VC, who at the time in yeah. late August, I hadn't heard of them. And they just started a couple of weeks earlier. So as time went on, I kept, I kept hearing their name um, and I kept reading about them. And so I started looking into it. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, it, it was interesting. So, uh, as, as I found stuff, I, I decided I would try to do a uh, engagement. So since I already knew they were familiar with my work, I just reached out to them as myself and said, Hey, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's talk. And, uh, we did. Hey, and I want to, I'm going to show an image here. Late future me put the image up like over here where I'm pointing, hopefully. Um, <laughs> otherwise I'll just look like an idiot pointing up in the air. <laughs> Um, I see people on YouTube do that all the time. We're like, "Hey, find here and here," and then I don't see the images. I'm like, "You didn't got, you didn't connect to future you when you did right. it. like you have an image there of the coolest like pop doll or something. Did you create yeah. it using AI or what? 
and Anastasia, the other analyst that I work with, she, she created, I tried and I did a miserable job. And then in like an hour, she did it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she made that. I mean, she really does have skills. And frankly, yeah. I can't believe we haven't had her on the show. We need to bring her on if you'll permit. Um, but yeah, man, that doll or that image is like, yeah. like people already want to, like they want orders placed for it. I know I've been asked if we're going to make a bobblehead version to sell, uh, <laughs> which made me laugh. Merchandise. That's a whole new level, but I, I don't think we're going to do that. But yeah, that, that, I have had people request that. Well, it is pretty creepy looking. So, yeah. Um, so, so ransom and expose the story of ransomed VC. So where is this? Like, where is the gang located? I mean, yeah. So when I no. So when I when I reached out, one one of the things that was different about this research is they spoke really good English. So instead of having just a few engagements, I talked to them regularly for several months. Um, but the going back to that, they they do at least write in Russian. I've never spoke to them in Russian, so I don't know. But but yeah, the the main guy is from Bulgaria, um, not Russia. And uh, I actually didn't come across anybody in in it that that was russian that i know of um okay. not that i talked to everybody I only talked to, to the four of them but but the, none of them were, were russian and uh they were in different parts but the guy who who runs it yeah he's he says he's in bulgaria i believe that he is in bulgaria there's been doxes on him not by me by other people it looks like that's that's legit and uh there was some other there's other there's evidence there. of that yeah and their system looks like it was taken down was it a law enforcement sting no it's actually the site's actually um back up but what what happened is uh they they actually took their own site down um because some another group had gotten arrested that they had ties to they didn't exactly explain it all up front but i figured out my research this other ransomware group uh ragnar locker um had been taken down and but at the time they just put hey six, six guys associated with us got got arrested we're we're shutting it down and they didn't actually they, they pretended to shut down they just rebranded but but the point is is that you know it, it it wasn't it wasn't an actual arrest of anybody in their group and that that's why everybody that looked for it was like okay well this guy's just making things up because there's nobody there was no ransom vc arrests it wasn't this the the guy who runs it created it used to have some an association with ragnar locker um he didn't work for them but he they, he, he did some work with them and uh and yeah so so they got arrested i guess it spooked him and yeah he took he took off for a bit but the site's back up now um and he changes his name like every two weeks. So I don't even know what to call him anymore. I call him Ransom Support because that's how I knew him. And prior to that, his name was Impotent of all things. <laughs> really? Yes. Yeah. He used to run a different pro – before Ransom VC, they were uh, – he ran a forum called Exposed VC. Um, ah. So, yeah. it's uh, and, Yeah. because and, and you have – and I'll put some images up here where it you have uh, – Ransomed VC is now uh, res Resdovic, uh, Res yes. or something like that. Coming yeah, he just told Telegram, and so apparently he changes that quite a bit. Yeah, lately he just told me he's about to change things up again. I don't know if that means he's going to change the name of the operation or what, but uh, he told me to get my pen ready because he's getting ready to change things up. And I'm like, man, my hand hurts too much from doing all this writing. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 what is the story with him? Like what, 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 what were your, what were your findings? What did you find about? Yeah. So basically they weren't a traditional ransomware gang, like, like, like Lockbit or Black Cat or, or, or those type of operations where you have, you know, affiliates that share a percentage. Instead, uh, what he did is he hired people that were younger with less experience, uh, that couldn't, you know, his words, make the cut with, with some of the more, um, known gangs um and he would just pay them a salary which he claimed was between twenty five hundred and five thousand dollars but based on the people that i talked to they either got very little or they didn't get paid at all so mm. um yeah so so that that that's been an issue and that's one of the reasons you know the only the only people they screw over more than their victims are other criminals uh, there's a lot of criminals and they have a lot of enemies but um, but yeah, so so they 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 would actually have data. Sometimes they would do attacks. Often they would 
obtain the data by stealing data from other criminals and or um, buying it. But that goes back to, to, to their to their origin story where when they ran a forum before, think about it. And running a forum is really smart if you're a cyber criminal because you have all these criminals that are doing business on there and you have access to the server that, that has all the logs, um, all the conversations, all the you know connections, everything else on it. So you get a lot of uh, you get you get a lot of data on other criminals. They can use it to blackmail them. They could you know in, do web injects. They can do a lot of things to 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 get information and uh, take advantage. And, and I think that that was just part of their their long term scheme to to make money. Um, like I said, it's it's it, they screw this game. Not it's it's just the thing where they they don't care if you're a criminal, a legit company. It doesn't matter if they can benefit from it, they will. Um, and so that's again, that's why they have a lot of enemies. So okay, yeah. Yeah. so so this this group they had were were they affiliated with breach forums with the, the main forum? Yes, yeah, so that's create a site that mimicked breach forums yeah so they were kind of at a not kind of they were in this massive war with breach forums and some of the other prominent hacking forums after raid forums which was sort of the original and what's now kind of a cookie cutter theme uh they were the original and when raid went away um a number of sites came up to try to take its place breach was one of them um expose was one of them Uh, there, there there were three or four black forums but the, the problem with it is that just like with Raid, the FBI and Europol kept arrest, arresting the people who owned it and taking the site down, which is why it's so shocking that these guys kept standing stuff up. I would not want to be a forum owner after seeing multiple iterations of this happen where, where people are getting arrested, but uh, they do. But they but they kept doing it. They kept and, doing it. And, and, so, and then what is their affiliation with, uh, with Lockbit? You have, a, uh, yeah, yeah, because there's there's several of these forums. Are these some of the same forums that Lockbit is banned from now? No. Uh, so where he had an account, the, the guy Ransom Support that owns Ransom VC, um, he had an account on one of the, the two the two main hacking for Russian underground hacking forums are XSS and Exploit. Uh, so XSS is the main one where these where these guys spend most of their time. And that is where uh, ransom support create an account under a different name and made the comments on the the lockbit thread on the ransomware diaries. Uh, but but he was only on there for a few days because they banned him because he started talking all this ransomware stuff and writing in English. And those are two. That's a quick way to get kicked off. You're an English speaking person and you're talking about ransomware. Because they have a they have a ransomware ban, but it's very selectively enforced which is one of the reasons that with the whole Lockbit thing, he got so ticked. But anyway, uh, they did enforce it with Ransom VC. But again, that's probably because he, he was writing in English. And that's kind of, you know, just a big red flag uh, to look like you're law enforcement or somebody else when you're on those forums. So, but but those forums uh, are Russian. The, the ones like um, Breach and Raid, they're you know, most of those are pr- pr- predominantly English speaking. There are other languages spoken, but they're predominantly English speaking. Um, and they're more hacking forms outside of the Russian culture. So uh, that that's that's the big difference between XSS exploit versus the rest of them. So when Raid went away, um, also the other forms are like like are, are more clear net forms. You can get them to the internet from the internet or from the dark web, which is true with the Russian ones too, but, but breach and all that stuff has primarily been accessed on, on the clear, on the regular internet. So breach has gone up and down several times. There's been seizures, there's been arrests and new owners. There's an iteration of it right now, as we speak that, that exists and it's fairly popular. Uh, exposed went away. Dark forums is still there, but they all look visually the same. They're literally, you know, built and designed off the same templates as raid forums. They look like raid forums. Some of them even have the same categories and subcategories and things of that nature. So what is that? Uh, so what is what's that? that? Like, Sorry, like, trying like, to... like if they're all looking the same, does that yeah. have does that... The significance of that to you? 
Um, well, so because they wanted to capture the user base from raid forums, obviously one of the best ways to do that is make people feel like home, make it look exactly the same, and then hope that it is uh, populated with similar content and you get some of the same people from it. Um, and, and that's that's exactly what they did, and, and that's why they all look the same. Uh, but but even with some of the like with with, it, with Ransom VC, when they stood that up after Exposed VC went away, the first four days it was a forum too, and and I guess I guess they either changed their mind or they realized that people were going to figure out that they were associated with Exposed VC, so they changed it to a ransomware uh, themed website. After that, um, later they did stand up a separate forum outside of ransoms.vc that remained a data leak site and they did stand up a, a ransom forum called ransomed um, and the main differences with with it with those forums exposed and with ransom uh, is that they have ransomware categories uh, where you can talk uh, you can have threads you can have those conversations you can sell services and you don't get banned so that that's one of the big differences from the Russian forums so let's so let's Let's set some context for some listeners and viewers that may not live in the dark web, right? Um, these forums, they're accessible on the dark web, meaning you download the Tor browser, you use Tails, you use a separate computer, and you get on the dark web through the Onion router, right? And yes. they are forums. In the forums, they're essentially almost like a Facebook like for them, isn't it like where you can have, well, it's, it's more, it's, it's got more features than that, but you're able to, well, what, what would you compare it to that regular normal people <sighs> go to the dark web could relate it to? What is a forum like? I'm trying to think of what would be a good example. Documents to it, store documents, create. Yeah. Documents. So it's not like Facebook, but it, it is, they are more like, Right. Uh, taking a step back in time, like historical, you know, forums with threads, I would say more like Reddit than, than Facebook, but I, I don't have a one for one comparison, but it's, 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 it's in Reddit in the aspect that you have. My you know, space almost. Yeah. Well, but with those, you can have, you have pages and stuff. So that's kind of the difference is they have, they have topics and you create, create threads under these topics. So yeah, I, I think probably Reddit would be a closer yeah, analogy. But, right. And yeah, on there, yeah. a lot of cyber criminals gather and what do they exchange? What type of stuff do they exchange? Oh man. So everything from selling or giving away leaked data, um, selling access. So you have access brokers there, malware developers can sell, you know, malware on there. Um, exploits vulnerabilities are sold. Um, you can do things like uh, if you want to hire someone to DDoS a website, you can do those services. They have what's uh they have this service where you have a middle, it's called a middleman service. So let's say I wanted to, to, to take down a do a DDoS on a site. Um, there is a middleman that handles everything so that if somebody, so that the two parties that are involved aren't, are, they remain anonymous. They, they aren't easily exposed. Only the middleman. Should, so you can be, pay should one of them be caught by law enforcement for, from some country, right? They wouldn't be yeah. able to rat on the other. Correct. Yes. The two parties wouldn't know one another. It's correct. That's organized crime. Right. <laughs> right? That's what it's all about. The problem is, though, is with some of these administrators, like with Exposed BC, the criminals got upset because they claimed that he would take their money and not always do the service. So, <laughs> so there's always that risk, you know. Well, yeah, and there's right. There's not necessarily honor among thieves, and then the, and then if they have an issue, then they go to these tribunals, these arbiters, right, and yes. try and get their try and get their money back. And the, on the Russian forums, not on the the English speaking non Russian forums like that I just mentioned. So not raid, breached, or ex exposed. Those type of forums don't have arbitration. That's on the Russian forums, but they they have that, and it is. A, it's very structured, organized. The other forums are not. <laughs> okay. And what is the significance of the Russian-speaking forums and the English-speaking forums? Uh, Russian-speaking forums have been around for over 20 years now or around 20 years now. Uh, there's a whole culture and community there. Uh, it's very different. There is – in, until I really got into this, I didn't – 
I didn't really get to understand the Russian culture, not that I claim to be an expert by any means, but I understand a lot more than I did back before I started getting into ransomware. Um, it's just, it's hard to explain. It's just more of a camaraderie type of uh, atmosphere um, where a lot of these people interact, know each other and have known each other because the forum has been around for so long that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just relationships are built. Whereas these other, you know, the, the, the English speaking forums that I've been referring to, you know, they come and go, there's no camaraderie, everybody's stabbing each other in the back. Not that that can't happen on, on the Rus Russian forums, but it, it's, 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 you just have less of that camaraderie. There isn't that same structure and there's definitely not an authority at the top, like there is on the Russian forums that sort of hold the balance of power to keep things in sync. And the Russian forums are the ones that have that, um, of that system of justice, essentially. Right? The people's court, yep. <laughs> court, okay. The cyber people, the cyber criminals court. Yeah, I'm calling it that. They don't call it that. That's what I call it. <laughs> I don't know what they call it. But, and, and this, are the, are the Russian forums accessible through Telegram or is it all through the dark web? So they did, it's mainly through the dark web. They do have some clear net access, but obviously if you're a criminal, you're not going to use the clear net access. So they do have clear net access and I guess, you know, um, you could use that, but yeah, it is predominantly accessed. The difference I guess would be with the English speaking ones, their main access is the clear net version. So the traditional internet, and then as a mirror, as a backup, they have dark web. The Russians are opposite. They have their dark web as the primary, and sometimes they'll have a clear net that is like a secondary as a mirror. And that's that's the case. Interesting. And when you say clear net, you mean internet through Telegram and yeah, right. and yeah. allegedly anybody is regular browser. Yeah. Right. You can access it, you know. No encrypted tunnels and all that great stuff. Yeah, we we we've had some interviews with people that have been talking about telegram and how there's so much cyber crime just out in the open right there um, there is i mean the, the, not taken i mean most people are asking me how is this not taken down like on the telegram part we understand on the dark web there's yeah. anonymity and it's it's entrenched and it's over in russia but the telegram part where you have a lot of these cyber criminals located in North America sometimes, how, how are they not caught is what I keep getting asked. Well, that, that app is built for encryption and anonymity. So, and it's changed hands several times. It was developed by, um, it, it was a, a guy in Russia. He then sold it and yeah, it's changed hands, but, but, you know, because it's built on encryption and anonymity, well, it's not the dark web. It's not like it's the internet. I mean, you can get to it to the internet, but it's 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 got these things built in that, that bring you in and in when you use it. Um, the biggest difference between Telegram and the forums, uh, I'm going to sound old here, but uh, with the forums, I like it because it's structured. You you have to post something and wait for a reply. With Telegram, it's so much chatter and annoying ass people on there, <laughs> just putting up stickers and images of their cats and memes. And you know, I have to do it as a researcher, but I would never spend my time there. <laughs> outside of that, uh, I Sounds much prefer like forums. A, yeah, for for those I've been on it, obviously, but if, for those that haven't been on it, it almost sounds almost like a Discord. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You know, we all have a lot of data and it has to positively, absolutely stay safe. It can't get into the wrong hands. And the biggest challenge we have is how to transfer it from here to there. We all know as leaders that legacy tools that transfer our important files and sensitive data are mostly outdated and fall short on security, especially with the demands of today's remote workforce. Relying on outdated technology puts our organization's brand at risk. And that is unacceptable. So we're excited to invite you to step into the future of completely secured managed file transfer from our friends at KiteWorks. KiteWorks is absolutely positively the most secure managed file platform on the market today. They've been FedRAMP moderate authorized by the Department of Defense since 2017. And unlike traditional legacy systems with limited functionality, KiteWorks has unmatched software security with ongoing bounty programs and regular pen testing to minimize vulnerabilities. And the coolest part, they have easy to use one-click appliance updates you will love. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. And now, the show. 
Or yeah, anything. yeah, it's it it is much. Yeah, it, it's real time chats versus posting, replying, posting, replying. The the forums have moderators, so when you have um, you know, some annoying person that's, you know, putting obscenities or posting again, pictures of their cats and it's off topic, they remove them on telegram. It's a free for all. So they're both good re resources for information. Just my personal opinion. I much prefer spending my time on, on forums. Um, I much more enjoy the community. Um, if I'm going to have to be amongst criminals, I'd rather be on one where there's some, some basis of, of control and the conversations are on point versus, pictures of your cat. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So in Ransomware Diaries 4, you talk about two things that I have researched a ton out of. Like one was our very first episode on this podcast a year and a half ago, two years ago, was on the original Sony breach, right? Yep. The very first one, but the one... Right. Not the North Korea one, but yes. <laughs> it was even yeah. to North Korea, but there were still a lot of open questions around it. Yeah. Um, and you talk about the Sony breach in Ransomware Diaries uh, 4. You also talk yeah. about the Move It breach, which we yes. have a deep dive on. And, I mean, nobody has done a better job than Brett Callow over at Emisoft. I know Brett, he's yeah. Of, like, he's <laughs> one of my, uh, like, he's so good. Um but I just keep. I, Let's not stack his ego too much. He's okay. All right, he's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the top friends of Brett. <laughs> I'm just it's harassing. Him. I know it's, but it's, but like the way that they've been tracking move it is just amazing. So yeah. So what is the significance? So you're like in ransomware diaries four. You mentioned that on September 26, 2023, ransomed VC, which is ransomed support as you call them, right? The guy yes. so known as Info. Ransom VC is the operation. Ransom support is who the guy's moniker who runs it. Yeah. And he's, he also went by impotent. Like this. He, he went by him? impotent. That's right. Yeah, that I, means or he's, I, he, he made it up because the guy who got arrested from raid, his name was omnipotent. And he made a variation of that. That's is making fun of him, trolling him. And he went by impotent. Um, I have all those names. That's my favorite, but it's funny because when you read some of the chat, con the, the engagement conversations in, in my report, you know, I, I'm asking, you know, this other hacker, when did you find out that ransom support was impotent? And it's just like, I get so used to saying the names. I didn't realize what I was, what I was saying. It's just, then when I'm reading it, it just, you know, makes me get the 13 year old in me has to giggle. That's hilarious. <laughs> so the, so the, so they claimed this past September. Just of several months ago, about six months September ago. September twenty third. Yeah, September twenty yeah. They stole two hundred and sixty gigs of data, quite a big haul. Yeah. Um but what happened? Was it real? Did it not happen? Did they sell well, the data? Was it old data? What happened? Yeah, so the amount, the size of the data stolen was was less than what they claimed. Uh, the actual breach took, so I've, I've gone through the data uh, to, to try to validate if it was authentic. And it is authentic. However, it was a single computer from Sony. The breach took place on August 11th. The data start was first talked about amongst criminals on August 23rd. And on August 26th, it was leaked publicly. Some of it was leaked publicly uh, by Ransom VC. The problem is on breach forums, there was another um, uh, hacker that used the alias at the time, Major Nelson, who uh, claimed to have the same data. And he posted that. Um, and I went through both of them. They, they, they both had the same data within them. So they both were the same data set. They both came from the same source. It was legitimate. It did look like it was legitimate, authentic data from a Sony system out of um, Japan based on the language settings on that system. Uh, and it had a lot of development stuff on there. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot for Sony to take a loss for by the data itself. It wasn't really that useful. But with all the media around it, it certainly hurt them uh, from that exposure. And yeah. Ransom VC is brilliant at branding and marketing themselves. Uh, that, that's really where they excel and getting people hyped up about them and to believe that, believe that the story they're telling is true um, because, you know, it's being reported, it's being talked about by researchers, whatever it might be. They use that as leverage to get people to believe that that's true. And, you know, Sony's bad. The State Farm thing was even worse. 
but I asked, so I asked ransom support, how the hell this other guy got the data, you know, who had it first. And, um, there was a, basically there, there, there was somebody working for him named Intel broker and allegedly he got the, the, the data first and whether Intel broker is also major Nelson or vice versa, I, you know, I can't keep up with all of it. There, there's, that's what ransom support said is he's the same guy, but, but who, who knows if that's true. But the point is, is that these two people had the data <laughs> at the same time and only one of them could have stolen it originally. So the other one had to have stole it from them. Or it, I guess, you know, people will say, oh, well, you could take it at the same time. But that's not what happened. The criminal got it and then it was was obtained by someone else. Uh, who got it first? It's hard to say because they both came on, on the same, uh, around leaking it around the same time. So in... What was the tie-in with the Move It breach and Clop? We've we've talked about the the Move yeah. it breach because Move It is an encrypted file transfer platform, and uh, they've been uh, compromised in one of the largest compromises of the decade. It seems yeah, for sure continues yeah. to count, and yet it's like the media doesn't really talk about it because I don't think they understand it. But the Clop ransomware gang, they're not even launching ransomware. They're just leveraging the vulnerabilities that they have and Taking they're data. stolen yeah. all the data, right? It's just yeah, they're, they're not encrypting systems or any of that. They don't even have affiliates anymore. I mean, right. they, so it's a whole different operation. But to answer your question, uh, so there's not a tie, but the CLOP stole a bunch of data from, from Sony. So as a researcher, the first thing I need to do is see, is this data from that, that breach? Because that's something else that I um, you know, found that Ransom VC would do is take previously stolen data, alter, uh, edit it, you know, put in some other new fake data or add in publicly you know, access, accessible documents or whatever it might be to try and make it refreshed and look real and then try and extort organizations for it. So I need to make sure that wasn't happening and th it wasn't, this was separate. That data was global, this, or and a lot of it um, was in the, I'm sorry, that data from CLOP was mostly from the US and this data was was not. The CLOP data had also a lot of systems. This does not, it came from one system. So a little bit different. Yeah. Or yeah. from what it looks like in over in Japan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, so one of the things that we've discussed you and I on this podcast is the software, the ransomware software, the malware that is developed by these organized cybercrime gangs um, is designed in a way that it will not attack or it should not attack certain speaking languages like cis countries like russia Correct. iran like whatever the the eastern bloc countries that are that 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 are done and what is the reason for that so um the the main reason is you know uh these guys are primarily based out of russia and russia doesn't consider it a crime as long as you don't attack a russian entity so what a lot of these ransomware variants do is they just look for the language uh, being used on that computer and that system. And if it matches one of the language that are spoken in those CIS countries, especially Russian, it will not uh, execute the in, in unleash the ransomware, if you will, to encrypt all the data um, on the system itself. So it, it's it's just a sort of a, a built in precaution. Obviously, it's it's. It's code. You can change that, um, but but that's sort of until ransom VC. That is a rule that I have always seen uh, followed. It's it's one of the few that that's not been broken, and it's funny because I was on the um, uh, I, I use this service called eCrime, and I'm I'm looking at their website at, at the data for breaches, and the, the the darker the red, the more breaches there are. And, and Russia had the, this, the tiniest little hint of off color, and I go and I hover over it, and it says one. one. <laughs> There's been one report in an in, uh, incident that they have in all of their data, and that's Ransom VC. And it was a hospital. <laughs> so two two no's, two things you're not supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. So in, in Ransomware Diaries 4, you, you have a, a, a subsection that's called, don't make Putin come to my house. Yeah, because he said that to me, so I, I thought it was funny, so I made it the, the made it the, the title of that section. So, like you just pointed out, there's one rule that's sacred among all these ransomware gangs, and that is you do not target Russia or other countries within the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is CIS that we talked about. Yeah. And former Soviet Union countries. Yeah, and the rule is, well, you've seen... You know, we saw our like Revil, our evil get taken down in Russian style where they 
bash in the doors and they have these videos, these very dramatic videos. They haul them through the Russian legal system and stuff, arguably because at some point, for some reason, we believe or we we surmise that they fell out of favor with the Russian government. Is that fair? Yeah. Or there's political motivations. But yes, right. that's, that's fair. It doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Right. It happens so, in the Ukraine more than Russia, but yeah. Yes. Or it did. In the Ukraine. Yeah. These days they're busy, but yeah. Right. So these geniuses at Rush at Ransom VC on October 4th, 2023, they posted a victim notification. And where did they post this? On, the uh, on their on their data leak site, they posted it. And do, so on Ransom VC. Do they keep do do a lot of these gangs keep their data leak sites on both the clear net, like on Telegram as well as on the dark web, or do, is it mostly only on the dark web? So what they do is they'll they usually It'll be on the dark web. Some of them have it on um, on ClearNet, on the regular internet. Uh, so Ransom VC had both. Again, with Ransom VC though, ClearNet was the primary. The dark right. web was the the backup. And then on, they used Telegram for their group chats and their um, and like their their group channels to leak data. And it's just another mechanism, sort of in their infrastructure. So they leak the data on their website. And then they also use Telegram um, to, to try to sell it, to market it, to leak it, you name it, they do it, to have conversations about it. Uh, it's just another mechanism to, to, to leak it and try to embarrass the, the victim and try to get money from other criminals. Got it. And on October 4th, 2023, Ransom VC posted this victim notification for a Russian medical center. Yes, but that's not what Will Ransom support says, but that's that's what it really is. He, showed, he he told me when I asked him about it, I was like, why would you attack something in Russia, let alone a hospital? And he said to me that uh, he must have been high when he did it and that he thought it was a plastic surgery center. But you just go to the website. It's clearly a hospital. You just look at the services and everything offered. It's clearly a, a hospital. Um, so he but as I said, he's not in Russia. And that's why I believe him is because of stuff like this. He just that. That's why he did it, because he just doesn't care. In your investigation of these guys, like, what did you, where was the evolution? Like, first of all, where do you think they're based? So they're, I think they're, uh, you know, the people who work for them come from all over. But, you know, I, I, he's primarily in, in Bulgaria. He's got people who work from them that are, you know, some are in, in uh, UK, some are in South America. They're, they're, they're all over the place. But those are just some of the places where I, where I was able to, somewhat validate as much as you can that that's where where some of the people that worked with them came from um i actually didn't find that there were many r true russian nationals working for him so it was a different operation it was all about perception and, and making you believe something but that's not what the reality was that's why it was interesting to me yeah exactly so what a couple things i want to ask you so wh where is where is ransomed vc today like, where did your investigation wind up? Like, yeah, I was talking to the ransom supporters. I was talking to him earlier today because that's what I—that's when he was trying to tell me he was starting something new. But yeah, no, he's st he's still in Bulgaria. Uh, you know, he—I—I I, I can't say this for a fact, but I believe he has ties to or organized crime in that country. Um, but but regardless, he seems to be pretty pretty connected. He's not afraid of the police. So uh, I don't think anything's going to happen to him anytime soon. But, you know, he, he lives there. He's, he's from there. He, for some reason, has a strong liking. Uh, he's very fond of Serbia. Um, so he, I don't believe that he's Serbian, but I do believe somebody that he knows or is close to him must be because some of the aliases uh, and names he's used in the past have been affiliated with Serbia. The, the, new, the newest program, the Raznovic, that's affiliated with the Serbian gangster, their telegram channel, Tigers Barkhan, uh, that's also affiliated with that same uh, Serbian gangster. Uh, so, so there is a, there is a nexus there, but, uh, but, but I do believe that he is actually Bulgarian. Do you see a lot of cyber crime gangs or ransomware as a service gangs in Serbia or in Bulgaria generally? Or are they I've not seen no, just 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 this guy, just these guys. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody else uh, out of Bulgaria. I, I mean, I'm sure there's might be st stuff out there like smaller pockets that I don't even look at. But but no, I've not seen any of the, you know, the the whatever we'll call the big box ransomware gangs. You know, the, the name brands, if you will, that that people hear about in the news all the time. They're the I've not, BMWs that's... of cybercrime right. are like Lockbit and Black Hat and right things like right. that. 
right? Yeah. The, so yeah, I've not seen anybody. You know, I'll, I've definitely seen many affiliates, threat actors uh, based out of that that region. Uh, there very well could be, you know, some groups based out of Serbia, but, but Bulgaria, there is. I have not seen any prior to this. Based on your findings, do you think that he was involved with Ragnar Locker gang? Because Ragnar Locker was a legit. Yeah, a real Serbia. deal. Yeah, and they had six people affiliated with them that had been arrested. He claimed that he post or he posted that I found that six people affiliated with me have been arrested. Is there any validity? Yeah. That? So let me, let me just break it, break it down real quick. Uh, so the ransom VC operation started August 15th uh, on August. I'm sorry, on October 22nd, they launched a separate forum called ransomed forum. Um, by launching that, it still takes time, money and resources that's showing they're expanding their operation not closing it down. The very next day on October 23rd, uh, six men were detained, got doors kicked in, brought in uh, by Europol um, that were considered or believed to be members of Ragnar Locker. Uh, seven days after that, on the 30th of October, Ransom VC announces it's shutting down. They put up a message saying six people associated with me have been arrested or may have been arrested, as we said. Uh, and like I said, nobody believed them. Once uh, I got the information that that he was associated with that gang and I looked at the dates and everything, it lined up perfectly. He must have been concerned that because of those that, that are the arrest and the detainments that someone was going to, to leak his information and, and have them shut down. Um, so if when I got the information, I, it sounded out there to me, but it fit like a it fit like a glove. You know, I mean, it, everything lined up with it. Um, and the person who gave me the information was one of one of his, you know, t top, you know, uh, affiliates, if, if you want to call him that, you know, a, 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 a hacker who was well known long before Ransom VC in the hacking world. Uh, so I, I believe him. You know, I believe that it's true. It makes sense. The circumstantial evidence completely fits. It's like I had this missing puzzle piece and he handed it to me and I put it and it just fit perfectly. Excellent. So leaders... Uh, in business and in like healthcare fields, um, they ask sometimes, you know, when our data gets stolen or if, if our data gets stolen um, and a cyber criminal gang posts it on the dark web, mm -hmm. our clients and our customers and our people don't go on the dark web. So, how does that really expose us? Like they're saying, well, we're going to publish it. And we're like, yeah, but you're publishing it on the dark web. Nobody that we know goes on the dark web. So who are you publishing it to anyway? Yeah. So there's, there's two ways. One, it, one is researchers and reporters and both monitor those sites, you know, so mm -hmm. that, that information is going to, going to be obtained. Uh, but two other criminals do, and it often, you know, it's, it's, it's to sell that data if the victim doesn't want to pay. So it has sort of a, a, a dual purpose. One is to notify basically, you know, journalists and researchers that this has taken place and two to sell stolen data to make money in case the victim doesn't pay. So they still get some sort of profit from their work, or at least that's how they view it. And that data can be used in other attacks or to go yeah. to the actual people and dox them or extort them. Yeah. There's lots of things that can be used for everything from like, let's talk about when, remember when Revil uh, popped uh, Apple or, or what a contractor or a, a contracted company that worked for Apple and got all their engineering diagrams, you know, that they, they then went after Apple, even though that wasn't who was compromised. So yeah, there's definitely, you had Accenture, they got hit by Lockbit and according to Lockbit, three targets he had in the following months after that, that were airlines uh, came from that data. I couldn't validate it, but that's what he told me. Um, so it, it definitely happens where they use that data to then harm other organizations that either did business or were, were clients of them, things like that. That's absolutely, this is, this is a great story. So what, like high level, what's your impression of, of the <laughs> Ransom VC, this, this guy, I mean, Ransom um, VC is the organization, Ransom Support is the moniker for the gentleman here. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because it's been such a crazy ride. Uh, he's always been, um, 
to, to me personally, he's always been professional, you know, respectful, makes jokes, you know, water cooler talk. Uh, we got to know each other pretty well. Um, he definitely, uh, what's the right way to say this? I, I don't want to call him mentally ill, but he has issues he needs to work out. Um, he, he, he lies a lot, but he doesn't lie because he can't tell the truth. He lies. And this is the problem with, with assessing them is a lot of people just think he's a scammer and, you know, he just makes up these lies. But when he makes up lies, he is looking three steps out. There's, there's a reason he's saying this, this lie and it's going to affect something down the road. And I found that out because I was looking back. And when I started to take the lies that he would tell me or other people and then look at where they originated and where things ended up, there was there was there was always a motivation or a plan. So because of that, uh, you know, I, I would tell the researchers, I, I know that a lot of people aren't looking at these guys like a, a top level group, but they're causing a ton of damage. And half the time they haven't even done what they've said and they've gotten us all to believe it. To me, that is a problem because you just don't know what the truth is. And they very well may really have your data. They may have stolen it. They may have bought it. They may have made it up but you don't know. So that is harder than when you have a group, you know, like Black Cat or Black Bosta or, or, or any of these. And uh, it's, it's, it's just that you, you, you don't have a way to know. So with those groups, they have a reputation. They're concerned about their reputation. They most likely have the data that they say they have, but that's just not the case with, with these guys. These guys seem like they are masters at marketing and manipulation. That that is, it, I told him. I've told Ransom to support this so many times. Like he doesn't need to be a criminal. He should go. Should have spent his if he spent his time opening a marketing company because he. That is what he is. I hate to keep giving him compliments, but that, that is the one thing that that guy is brilliant at. I mean, he is is really good at making people uh, know uh, know their name, know their brand, make them believe they're ten times bigger than they are, and they have all this data on organizations that half the time they don't have half the time they do getting his name in the news. He even willed a lawsuit into existence with state farm. Uh, he, he basically state farm story. What happened there? Yeah. So, uh, basically, uh, they ransom BC posted state farm as, as a, uh, as a victim. Um, they claimed to have all, all of their data. They didn't have all their data, but they did have a database, um, that database, however, didn't actually contain any PII, and the person who actually did the breach uh, shared that with me so I could validate that it did not have PII in it, fully admitted that he did the breach and he knew way too many details that I, and, and he never lied to me. The, the guy, USDOD, uh, he might be a criminal, but uh, I've talked to him for three months. Unlike ransom support, um, USDOD has never, never lied to me. Um, he might say things I don't like, you know, as far as his actions, but they've always turned out to be true. So um, I looked at it. Uh, I was able to validate that there was no PII. The data is, is basically useless. However, because they posted the victim site and because they pull, they, they have tons of social media accounts. They're even on TikTok, ransom VCs, all, all these social media platforms. And they, they, they got all the spin and the buzz around it. You know, all of us, you know, we did it. Journalists, researchers, security vendors, you know, talked about the breach. It was made public and everyone bought into it because they read the headlines and State Farm customers did too. So even though they didn't actually have valid, what's that? So then the customers who allegedly <laughs> lost their PII went and sued State Farm? Yeah, the class action lawsuit. It's uh, it's in federal court now, and um, I know for a fact that it it's not real. Um, so it sucks because this is a victim. They didn't get they didn't get you know they didn't pay the ransom, so they didn't they didn't have to do uh, incident response. They didn't have to spend all these million dollars millions of dollars on that. But now they got to spend it in lawyer fees. And while I may not be a huge fan of insurance companies, this isn't right. What's happening to them? Um, this is, this is terrible. So it's, it's the first time I've seen something like this, but it really is a wake up call that we as researchers and journalists really need to, to, to not just report when a bad guy says they've read something, but we need to report on it when there's either solid evidence or the cost, the, the person that the victim itself has, has made a notification. Unbelievable. Well, John, thank you so much. I mean, as, as, as we wrap up, I'm, I, I want to ask you, there, there's been so much 
high level discussion on it seems like a lot of these gangs you saw what Klopp did with Move It, you see that a lot of these gangs are just almost evolving into a smash and grab. Like they want to just take the data. The the customers, the victims can can keep the a copy of their data. They just want to take it and then extort it. It's almost like becoming extortion as a service. Yeah. Is that yes. what you're seeing in the industry? Yeah, uh, that's, well, there definitely still is more traditional ransomware groups that encrypt and steal data, but we're seeing that model where it's simple extortion with, with just the data and no encryption more often. CLOP does it, Ransom VC, despite what they claim, I've never seen any evidence that they actually encrypted anybody's data. Um, you know, they're just stealing it. And I do think it's easier, it's faster, is a, it leaves less logs and things of, of that nature, um, and, and they still get the ransom. I, I honestly think we're going to see more of that. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with Lockbit about this, and he still felt like it's it's almost like when if you were to, to stab somebody on the on the ground bleeding, uh, you know, it, kicking them a few more times is still going to help. So why not do it? But but we're seeing other groups that have a different mindset uh, where where they're not, and they're simply stealing the data. So. I don't think that we're going to see traditional ransomware go away, but I do think we're going to see more of this movement where it's just data that's being stored. We need to come up with a new term for that because people get confused when you hear that, you know, near ransomware, you think encryption, but that's not always the case. Yeah. It's almost like extortionware or extortion as a service. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're on cybercrime junkies, extortionware. <laughs> well, so got all sorts of things being coined here. And have it, having said that, though, ransomware's up this year, right? Like it's like it is depending on which vertical. Some of it's up X percent, some of it's higher, yeah. lower, whatever. But so ransomware itself, the actual encryption of it is up, as well as now this extortion, where extortion is a service. Yes, that's correct. Um, the one thing that uh, I want to say though about that is. Again, this is based on my direct conversations with threat actors, as I've been told that the uh, ransom amounts that are being paid have gone down, which is one of the reasons the bigger ransomware gangs are pushing for higher volumes of attacks is because even though the numbers have been up, their income was was less. So by having more attacks, they're, they're hitting their numbers, if you will. Wow. And you had mentioned on... Um in our previous discussions that these ransomware gangs, like they, whether they're deploying ransomware or just extortion as a service, they get together it, almost like a sales force and chart out, like they have business meetings, don't they? Where, where they, yeah, they talk about the numbers and how this quarter is doing and what, what threats and what tactics are working and which ones are more profitable. Yeah, they do. Lockbit definitely does that. And you'll see that on some of the Russian forums, those type of conversations. But uh, but yeah, it, it, it definitely is something that takes place. Um, it's for, for these bigger organizations that are organizations, bigger threat actors that are making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I mean, think about it. It's it's, it's like a company. You've got all these resources. you got to have employees. you got to have people working for you. you got to have, you know, idea of what kind of money you want to make and, and things like that. And you want to make more than you did the previous year. It's literally like a business, except that you're committing crimes. Wow. Yeah. And only they're doing it from a part of the world where they're not going to get in trouble as long as they don't do it a certain way. Yeah. Hopefully someday that changes, but that is the case now. But again, you've got these other groups, like, I don't know how this guy's in Bulgaria. How, how does his door not get kicked in? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. um, that, that's why I said, I believe he might be tied to, to organized crime because how else, how else is this guy's door not getting kicked in? So, yeah. Well, John DiMaggio, thank you so much, sir, for uh, all your wisdom, your research. Um, we will have links to um, uh, Ransomware Diaries 4 in the show notes and below, as well as uh, I saw that you guys did an audio reading of it, an audio. I have to. They're so long. <laughs> i got to make it easy for people to listen to also. Well, you're doing the right thing, and you're helping law enforcement. You're helping people understand it and that's that's the whole key right because we can't understand Absolutely. uh we can't defend against something we don't understand so uh thanks for all the work and uh we will talk we will talk again soon
Um, uh, very, very, very excited about this work. We will have uh, images and uh, 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 pieces to it throughout this video as well. So thank you everybody Great. for listening and uh, we will all talk again soon. Well, that wraps this up. Thanks for joining everybody. Hope you got value out of digging deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Please don't forget to help keep this going by subscribing free to our YouTube channel at Cybercrime Junkies Podcast and download and enjoy all of our past episodes on Apple and Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and we thank you for joining us. Well, things aren't getting any safer online, and we're excited to tell you about our exclusive offer for Aura, which is linked in the show notes below. Hey everyone, this is your host, David Morrow, and we often get asked about individual safety and ways to protect loved ones or small business employees when they're online. So we turn to our friends at Cyber Threat Group, a full service security consultancy located here in the US, and they told us all about Aura. You might have even seen actor Robert Downey Jr. in their television ads. Look, identity theft isn't cheap. The FTC reports that Americans lost $8.8 billion in identity theft and personal fraud this year and can cost you personally hundreds of thousands of dollars. Aura provides it all. Financial and identity theft protection, a lightning fast VPN for online privacy, antivirus, a password manager, and even parental controls for safe gaming and spam call protection. So protect your family or your employees when they get online. Give the gift of online safety. Check out the link in our show notes from our friends at Cyber Threat Group today. Aura is a great way to protect yourselves online. Check out Aura today and stay safe online.